G'day, you're listening to the Big Breakdown Podcast with Chris Stafford and Harrison Marshall. Take it away, fellas. Hello and welcome along to Season 3 of the Big Breakdown Podcast, where in this season we are looking at coaching skills and today we are looking at activity structure for team sports. Um, Harrison, we've got a really good guest on today to uh, to chat about this area. Yeah, uh, we certainly have. Um, yeah, with vast amounts of experience in lots of different coaching coaching domains and levels of of the coaching chain, and um, and, a, and a fellow podcaster as well. That's yeah, coming on to to, to share his wealth of knowledge. So I'm I'm more than excited and very much looking forward to this episode. Yeah, he's also a, uh, a former teacher, so actually covering all our areas of rather than just rugby for team sports, he's got a bit of experience and everything. So I think it'd be, be really interesting to to hear what he's got to say and, and what we can learn from it. So today we're joined by Dan Cottrell. Dan has over 16 seasons experience as head coach and editor of Rugby Coach Weekly. Dan has provided thousands of subscribers worldwide with drills, insights and advice covering all aspects of coaching. A former player for Bath and Bristol, Dan is a level three coach, level two referee and course tutor. He's coached international rugby with Wales women, represented rugby with the Ospreys under 25, under 18s and under 16s and Swansea schoolboys under 15s. He's also coached his son's team through under 16s through to under 16s. He's a regu- regular contributor with the Connected Coaches and former director of rugby at Cranley School. Dan's goal is to help all coaches be the best they can and great coaches make great players. He joins us today to chat about coaching through games. Dan, how are you? I'm very well. Thanks for um, having me on, Chris and Harrison. No, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to have you, and thanks for, for giving giving up your time. Um, so the, the, the whole theme that we're looking at for, for this episode is just around activity structure, how best from, from sort of team sports perspective we can engage our players and maximise learning. Um, and obviously with... The, um, the Rugby Coach Weekly, you've, this sort of coach head and development stuff is something you've been doing for for, for quite a few years now. So ju- just sort of, before we get onto some of the stuff from that, over that years of journey that you've you've been going with the, the Rugby Coach Weekly, how, how has rugby coaching specifically sort of transformed within that time that, that you've noticed? Um, sometimes it's interesting to try and work out whether it has transformed because uh, some people will say it's old wine in new bottles and a lot of what... Uh, was being talked about in 2003 is what's being talked about now but just in a slightly different way and I think that there is also a danger that we're always trying to look for the new um, and really it's probably just trying to get some clarity in our own minds and somebody will come up with something and say oh that's it but actually all they really have done is they've just helped you see a little bit more clearly why you are doing the things you're doing or maybe just changed your mind um, and I suppose over the last, well, it's been the actual rugby coach weekly in one form or another has been going since 2003. And uh, I mean, from my point of view, I've learned a hell of a lot. I've been very lucky to speak to lots of different coaches and um, have my mind changed all the time. So I think the difficulty is that we will often go on to the pitch with so many different things in our own minds that we forget the players aren't necessarily in the same space as us. And they then struggle as we say, do this, do this, or do that in whatever way. I'm not saying we tell them to do anything because that's uh, another debate in itself on how much we speak. And they, they get confused because our, we're, we're 30, 40 sessions ahead of them in our own development. And they are still trying to do things, uh, piecing, piecing it all together. So, in essence, I think things are always changing, which is fantastic. It is also refreshing. And there's always a new cohort of coaches coming through who are interested in developing their own game. And there's lots of different ways to say what we want to say. But it, I don't think it's changed fundamentally. And actually, at reading some of the um, research papers more recently and the coaches coming up with what seem to be new ways, I think, well, in a funny way, I was probably being coached that in 1991 by some coaches 
whether they knew that it was the right thing or not. I mean, they were doing some things which were probably pretty horrible, but other things were very much like the way we want to be coached today. I think, um, I think to a certain degree, I, I, I probably, I probably would agree quite, quite massively with that. Um, I think, of well, my kind of understanding of it is, I think coaches now uh, are starting to hopefully develop a greater understanding to to why they're doing certain things. Yeah. I think that's what we're seeing from you know, a lot of from academic um, things that are dripping into um, into coaching. What's kind of what would you? what kind of tips and tricks have you kind of learned through through your journey to kind of filter out all the all the noise that we get in our heads in terms of where we think the players should be and where we want them to be and, and make sure that we just focus on that on that on that specific session and those specific uh, uh, specific set of skills that we want to focus on uh, well I, w- I wish i had a magic uh, button that uh, did sort of cut out the noise uh, I'm old enough that we used to have noise reduction buttons on our cassette players, and that would have been a quite a good button. But really, it just uh, it, it didn't. It wasn't that effective. I, I think, uh, and it's been said a lot, especially over the lockdown, that the more that you are connected to the players, the easier it is to understand what they want, and that 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 it it, it should go without saying, and yet uh, it is quite hard and you can't do it in a false way. I've seen coaches go in and ask a whole bunch of questions because they feel it's the right thing to do without really caring about the players in front of them. So it, the, the, the simple thing is, do you actually care about the people you're coaching? And do you care for, for what they, for the, for the right reasons? And that, that's a very hard thing to do. And if you're in a performance setting, of course, you are you caring about the results because you could be out uh, you could be out next week because you haven't um, haven't performed. And if you're in a de- development setting, say um, I, I know uh, that Harrison, you're working with um, so the Was Academy stuff, I think, and you, you're you're on a different you're doing a different path. But you see so many kids over the week. I mean, I look at my experience at Bristol Bears, and it's been brilliant at the moment, but. I, I've lost count of the number of different uh, boys we're seeing all the time, and you cannot make those connections you want to make. So it, it's a real challenge. However, uh, I think the, f- the first thing to do is to have a very clear idea of the one or two things that you want to achieve in that session um, and not become knocked off that session. And one of the things I've been doing more recently is to actually write down the questions that I want to be able to ask of the players before I get to the session and just focus on those questions, even if the session takes a different, a different direction, because uh, that's wonderful in some ways, but you've got to connect everything together. And if a player isn't connecting everything together, they just think it just goes randomly because in a sense it's going randomly, then the next session, they're not quite sure what's happened in the previous section. So, Things have got to have some path, some story. Um, uh, I mean, uh, some some coaches will use themes, uh, and that helps keep the story together. Um, so, yeah, uh, care, but also I think more recently I just started to write down exactly the questions I want to ask, and they don't have to be with a specific answer in mind. It's with them, with the players being able to come up with what they think uh, or they understand from, from the session. Yeah, and um, I think, you know, once again, um, I kind of, I think I kind of connect with massively with, you know, with, with what you're saying, um, you know, especially when we're talking about evasion sports and, and in particular with our knowledge in rugby, it can, um, rugby, like, like I've said loads of times, is a very complex game that's never really, you know, black or white, it's it's always grey. And you know, I think, you know, it's I quite like that idea of um, thinking of the questions that you want to ask because you know, that helps you guide them, helps you as a coach understand what the players are kind of seeing as you got as you both na- navigate your way through through the murky grey of of what a session can get to. Um, we've all in our minds have got ideas of where what we want a session to look like and then the actual expectations of what it, it could be. Um, you know, so I think you know, we've kind of questioned and pre-planning it. I think the other thing we've um, 
I've tried and I've done it with conversation with other coaches is actually um, plan interventions for what we think the players might struggle with within the session. Um, you know, actually, can we plan what we think? Uh, can we plan the regression? Can we plan the progression, or even completely a new? I think the RFP like to call it skill zone um, that we can that we can fall into as you know, to help them go through that. Um, is that something that you kind of explored within 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 your kind of coaching sessions? Uh, not not specifically, though. I I think that's a really good thing to be able to do. Um, and uh, if you're very experienced, you probably think you've got a whole range of activities to hand. However, I, I think it's important that the players are confident that they're going to move to something which can be clearly addressing what's going on. And now, the, the, one of the things I think more recently I've tried to think about is the difference between performance and learning, where in a session, performance can become quite clear. They, they improve because you're focusing on something. If you've done um, 20 passes off your left hand, uh, then you would hope by the end of it, their left hand passing would have improved. But that's that's only a performance. It's not necessarily that they've learned it or they've, be, they've become better at it. Um, th therefore, reacting to what the players are doing performance ways is sometimes the wrong way to be running a session. You've got to try and almost barrel through some of their performance problems, lead them to one side because they're going to be addressed at a different time. And I, I really like the idea of having those regressions, regressions or skill zones or whatever you want to call it to be able to step into if you feel that's appropriate for the way that the players are going at that time. Uh, because otherwise, um, you, it's hard to reflect on the session itself and think, uh, have I been efficient and have I been effective? I think that's <clears throat> that's definitely something with, there's obviously the last few years has been that emphasis on coaching through games and trying to use that as a way to um, help with decision making. But you, you're right. We tend to, as coaches, there's, there's elements where we might overcloud our own decisions, what we're looking for, because we haven't necessarily written down the key things that we want to see within that, that we want to see as our, like you said, the, the learning moments rather than performance. So mm -hmm. are they going to be able to execute that when we get out on, on the field? Because, there's there's times where and I know I've been guilty of it, it. You end up watching the session and you might be focusing on a specific um, attack, identifying space, but then you naturally just find yourself coaching the defense in quite a lot of detail, and you end up sort of drip feeding them with too much sort of information. Have you have you come across or, or, or tried yourself any ways that you can stay focused on on that task within your session without overclouding or overcomplicating the, the key messages that you want to get? Uh, well, I, I think that we're all trying to do that, and uh, it, it is it is a challenge for coaches because you have you have such a vast amount of knowledge, uh, and when you're watching, you can see things that you can say, "Well, I can solve this, I can solve this, I can solve this," and you're trying to solve so many different things. Uh, um, you, I think uh, I, I can't remember exactly who said it, but I think Doug Lemoff certainly um, talked about it. You're chasing six rabbits, and uh, you're never going to catch one. And that, that means that you, you, you lose focus. And um, I think you said, Chris, uh, that it, one of the key things for coaches is observing um, the session and therefore understanding whether what you're doing is, is helping and is it creating those learning moments. And sometimes uh, it is very difficult. I mean, uh, I try my best to use games as much as possible, but I've... I've changed my mind a little bit on that, not in terms of not using games, but trying to make the games more re relevant to the actual game. Um, and the the thing where I, the term which I'm using or thinking about more more now is it actually focusing on the internal logic of rugby. Um, I it I I could create people who are better decision makers at Sudoku uh, at crosswords. Um, but that's not going to make them better decision makers at rugby. I've got to think about what the game looks like for a rugby player more and more. And one of the uh, things at the Bears we've been talking a lot about in the junior academy is the, the relevance of touch rugby and the difficulties which come, come from using touch rugby to try and create the, 
the right internal logic of the game because uh, <laughs> Harrison, as you said, I, I absolutely agree with it. Uh, rugby is a very complex game. No one can ever say rugby is a simple game. It's probably one of the more complex invasion games. Uh, I mean, there's 17 rock rules, laws, <laughs> rock laws, uh, and that, I mean, that's hard enough in itself. So we've got to have, uh, the ball's got to be passed backwards. Um, and if we're playing too many games, and I, I, I'd like games which are uh, multi-directional and uh, sort of netball type games, that's not going to improve decision making. That's going to improve other bits and pieces. It's um, it's energizing. You talked about how you can make your sessions energizing. Yeah, bring in different balls, use different things. Don't think that's going to help in lots of other ways because it's not the game of rugby needs an oval shaped ball, which is complicated to catch. Uh, you need to run forwards and pass backwards. And you need to think about what happens around the tackle. Um, and that's very difficult. I mean, there are ways around that in touch rugby, and I'm sure that both of you have got uh, got ways. Well, maybe share some of the ways that you make touch rugby more more realistic without putting the shoulder right in. We've 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 spoke about this a lot in in sort of season one as well around uh, from from actual experience of of working at, at Leeds Beckett. We get lads that are coming in that are some of the most skillful players. Um, that I've seen over the last sort of few years, but when they come in at first year, they are the the very raw and they they have zero understanding of the actual game. So they've got all the skills, but in the locker, in the toolbox, and the rocket ready to go, but not one hundred percent know how to apply it in terms of linking to an outcome of a result or a performance. And then when that pressure comes in, that's when you notice an impact and change in how they can then execute their skills. Um, and that, that's sort of been what's what an interesting shift over the last few years is that the, these lads are coming in with, yeah, all the skills, but not not necessarily knowing how to apply them. And I think that's going back kind of to, to what you've sort of said there around the, the doing all this skill acquisition, finding space, moving the ball. But actually, do they know how to generate an exit set in their own 22 when the pressure's on them or when the results are focused, which when you start getting into first, second team rugby, within that, especially when we are at Leeds Beckett, that becomes more of a focus. And it's finding that balance, I suppose. It's how do we develop them while also getting that game understanding? Um, yeah, and how do you also, I mean, how, how, how do you uh, help them understand uh, the, the mismatch of size and speed in touch rugby? I mean, what, what, what do you do to change up the game? Uh, well, we've... <laughs> We, we tend to, um, how I've been coaching, especially not recently, I've been using more of the where we are on the pitch to sort of shape the type of session that, that we're doing, just to try and um, bring in more tactical awareness of, you know, uh, different forms of kicking, how well we can advance the ball forward, progress the ball forward, um, and trying to get players to scan, identify where the space is through making controlling the tackle area, getting a certain amount of bodies in there, trying to replicate a rock of some description. So it, it kind of does create the types of pictures that you might experience within a game. And I think that's, that's that if you're creating a touch game, I think that's what you want to try and you want to try and your players to experience what they're going to have in that game. So how can you adapt the rules that's going to give them some form of picture that they might see? Because again, you might see a picture and might not see it for... Again, it's because the, the variety of the game is that different. But it's trying to create movement patterns, experiences that they might then be able to put into a game, sort of prepared a little bit, I suppose. Yeah, and I, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge because obviously uh, we, we've got to understand that the players are probably in, in academy are playing rugby all the time. And every time they go into contact, they are... They're, they're damaging themselves and they've got to recover and we we can't just keep they can't keep bashing into each other otherwise they they won't they won't be standing up so yeah i think it's i think it's a real challenge and uh also in terms of coaching it when it's happening what do you do do you stand in in inside the game do you stand outside the game do you stand behind the game how much do you talk i mean what, what what's your approach i think that's I think that very much uh, varies depending on what you kind of you want as your outcome of the session. So, um, 
you know, before to, you know, before we go in into a session, it's really important that you've you know if you're working with yourself and, and co coaches, that we've got an understanding of right. This these are the key points that we want to get out of this session, and then we almost divvy up the divvy up those roles in terms of right. Today, I want you to look at you know attacking attacking shape um, off of an edge off of an edge breakdown. Um, you know, and then that's that's kind of how you can you can you know you can divvy up those roles and work you know and work together. Um, but I think you know if you if you want to really you know make a session effective and especially through games, it's it's important that you know you 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 plan you plan ahead. Um, so if you want to have a, a session in which you want to go heavy on kind of problem problem setting. That's probably as a coach, you'd want to take a bit more of a backseat role and let the players try and come up with creative solutions to you know to find the answers. And you know that might sit, that might where a session like that might vary depending on where you are in terms of a, an agreed upon curriculum that you might be looking to implement. So maybe towards the end of the session, so if it's a block in pre-season, um, one of your last few sessions before you go out. Um, before you go out and, uh, and play maybe a preseason game or, or actual start of the season, right? Me as a coach, I'm going to I'm going to set the players some problems here, and I'm going to see if the messages that we've relayed throughout the previous six weeks have actually resonated with the players, and let's see if what are kind of the leaders within the squad, the cultural leaders, the cultural architect, can they step up and uh, you know uh, uh, and and enforce those messages, and that kind of gives you as a coach in that example. Um, Either reaffirms or, or 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 scares you a little bit, depending on you know, how well you think that you may have got your your messages across. So when you come uh, when you use the word creative solution, is it what do you mean by creative? Um, well, it's um, it's so it, it's it's for me it'd be a solution in which, um, well. That, that, that works for them and they can and if I ask them they'd be able to, a true line of success was if I asked them you know, what were they seeing or, or, or why they chose that that decision that they could either either looking back in it on video or, or just in a communication with me tell me you know how they assessed the situation and came up with and came up with that came up with that solution now for me as a coach I wouldn't say there's a, a right or a wrong, wrong way of doing it because we're, we're all with different lenses, you know, from where I, I might be stood behind the player and actually see a completely different picture to what he's seeing with the ball in his hands. So, um, you know, I think when I say creative, I would just mean it's a solution that they've created um, that, you know, whether it's, success, whether it's successful or not, it, they can justify it and give and, 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 you know, and answer questions around you know, explaining what they saw and, and why they made that decision that allows me to understand and maybe then i can layer on my coaching up uh, on top of that so when you're i mean both of you when you're coaching with these players and you with all your players do you uh watch them and you think right there are three or four ways to solve this problem um and they choose one of those three or four ways and uh, it, it works or it doesn't work and it might work the next time is there ever a time when they choose a fifth way that you never expected? How often does that happen? Uh, is it uh, uh, in the sense that are they creating things which have never been seen before and are worth keeping? Or are they just discovering it for themselves uh, and you're saying, yeah, well done, guys. Now you know you've got that one in the locker. I suppose that on that, it goes back to kind of what you've just said is it in the locker because have they actually learned how to do that properly or was it just a, a fluke uh, hmm. outcome and and i think that it's ever evolving isn't it in terms of um the the, the same player is not going to in a, even in a game they might make the the, the 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 they might try and make the same decision but it could have a different outcome whether hmm. that's the other player knocks it on whether the they go to give it and a line appears and then they break through and actually break the line themselves I, I try to, to focus that sort of stuff on, on the outcome. So I never really sort of tell the players how to or what they should be doing where. I'd more give them feedback on the outcome and ask them questions about how they led to the decision that resulted in what they ended up doing, if that makes sense. So um might be if we're looking at a, a play in the midfield to get the ball forward, you know, they might have, you might just say to them, well, 
at the end of that, I come, what, what caused you to make that decision? Oh, well, I saw X, Y, and Z. I saw this space open and then I did it. So the, the, I, I tried to get them to use all the um, common language that we have, all the systems that we have in place to use that as a tool to then form the decisions that then they make based on what's in front of them. So how can they go into a game environment with everyone on the same hymn sheet in terms of how we play and what we want to do to be able to try and execute that based on the picture that they see. So I tend to not say do X, Y, and Z here. How can we do that? What can we do differently? What shaped that decision? Why did you come to that one? Um, Cause sometimes they might do a really, the decision might be absolutely spot on, but poor execution. Mm. And I'm now thinking of, um, as you say, that. Uh, one of the problems I often see uh, for fly half say clearing the ball from their own line is that they they stand in the wrong position to receive the kick and therefore they get themselves sort of, or, or crisscrossed in terms of kicking the ball out. So uh, in, in simple terms, if uh, I don't know this is not completely rugby focused uh, the podcast, but if you're on a, if you're on the left side of the pitch, a right foot kicker needs to stand to the right of the scrum. Because otherwise, uh, they they won't they won't be able to clear the ball very effectively. So, apart from uh, often the case where you're on the sideline, you're shouting across, "Stand to the right, stand to the right," um, and I'm sure we'll do it at some stage. Um, what what would be your approach to that kicker? Because I mean, I see it all the time with especially young or developing players uh, standing in the wrong place, and they they keep doing it. Um, what would be your approach just to to get them to stand in a better place next time? I think, um, well, first of all, you'd, you'd, uh, I'd let them fail because, you know, that's when you say fail, that's, that's, that's a mm. um, it's a chance for them to learn. Mm. Um, you know, one way you can, one way you'd look to approach it is, is you know, the have you tried or have you considered maybe standing a little bit further to the right? Um, and then maybe it's, it's choosing a conversation in terms of around right, what what do you, what, what, ben, what benefits what extra benefits have you got standing in this position here, um, and that might be you know as we're walking back to reset of a of an exercise or a um, or a drill, um, you know we can well, that, that's the kind of conversation we can pick up with the, the, those players. Um, I think you know as a lot of a lot of coaching can happen in between in between repetitions in between those breaks. And we don't have to call everyone in to have small minute conversations, right? The 10 here, I know that he's is he's struggling through something that you know we've identified that he, you know, he, needs to, he needs to stand a little bit further to the right. Now that could just be right, Dan as a 10. Um, have you tried have you tried to stand a little bit further to the right here and then and then and then then let them have a go? And then if it's if they're struggling again there, then we that's when we can look to reassess them. Um, and come up with and come up with potentially another solution if it might be a technical element of of, of the kick. So, Harrison, I didn't mean to lead you down a path where I'm going to disagree with you, uh, but I, my my mind's changed a little bit on that approach, uh, and I didn't meet, sort of throw it out to to create that. Is that uh, I just wonder now whether I might just not just tell the tech to do that because I'm just asking questions where I know what the answer is. He's just got to stand further to the right because that opens up the game. Uh, and I could ask him a whole bunch of questions, uh, but if, he's, if we've been working together long enough, he knows I'm asking those questions because there's an outcome I want. And um, I just think sometimes in those particular, and I know exactly when I would ask questions because they, they need to understand, otherwise it's no, there's no point. I might just say to them, Next time from a kick, the best place to stand, in my experience, is to the right in order to do this. So let's just go through the reasons for that. Duh, 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 right, okay. And then if they then in the game find themselves a bit uh, too square or whatever terms we want to use and it's not effective, then we can just say, right, just remind me of the reasons why. So I would give them some knowledge and then I would ask questions and I think I suppose that's just I'm just illustrating the point because uh, I'm just that's my approach now but it wouldn't have been my approach three or four years ago I would have just tried to tease it out of them in that way and I just wonder whether you think I'm being too too bossy 
Well, I'm, I'm, it's, it's me and uh, uh, one of my co-coaches uh, with the ladies team that I coach um, outside of work, we're having this conversation um, a few weeks ago around questioning because it's an interesting area in itself because I think now when you've been in a programme, like we're, we're, I've, I'm coaching some lads now where they've, they've been working with me for nearly three years. So they're kind of aware of what I expect and what my standards are, but then also in terms of they can preempt what the answer should be based on the question that I'm asking. Mm. So because you, I found myself that I'm getting into the habit of just doing what do we, how. So now I've started trying to throw some different questions in like describe to me. So mm. they've actually got to give a, a long more in-depth question that response as to what they want rather than just trying to fob me off with the same answer that they know that I want and still go and do the same the same, the same thing. But then I've, I've also noticed some shift in terms of how players respond to questions where they'll just give you that blank look and hope that if you uh, if they stay silent long enough that you'll just answer the question for them. Or just say communication. That's the thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. You're not allowed to say the C word, yeah. It's banned. Because I, I think that's interesting how because I, I I am sort of on the similar line that, that sometimes you just need to, to tell them because there's only so many times... Um, with, with with some sort of patience that you go well, we've had this conversation already and then you just got to tell them um like little you know like um in our game yesterday for example i've been sort of telling the fly half that in our when, we, when we've got a ball in our own half on the left hand side scrum he's got some freedom to play because it should theoretically the pitcher should be a 7v4 overlap if mm -hmm. the scrum's just outside the 15 so he should be able to go wide and be able to play a little bit rather than just feel as though he might have to kick off first phase, for example. But he still repeatedly sometimes just boots it downfield and you could argue that they've missed opportunities there. You, sometimes you do just need to tell them. And, and I do, I think we've we've not been... You, you kind of... We've sort of been encouraged to move away from it, but actually sometimes it's needed. Yeah, I, I agree. And... Um... I've tried to improve my questions. That's why I've I started to write down the questions before I go to training, so I can ask a question. Because I do, you do fall into that. Um, the you know what, what can you do to improve? And often it's communication comes up. Uh, we we try and move away from that. And sometimes it's just right. Remind me of the three principles we're looking at. And then when they don't do this, uh, that when they say them, I say, well, why aren't you doing them? Uh, is probably the, the next the next question. Um, and this, I think it's also a bit of efficiency here because questioning can just lose. If you have 15 players around you, you ask one question, only one person is going to answer it. Um, I've started using a bit of cold calling um, uh, more recently, something which I came across a while ago, but now I think more people are using it, um, and uh, which is where you, you say, all right, I'm going to ask this question. Uh, I'm going to give you about 15, 30, 15 to 30 seconds to think about it. I'm going to ask any one of you the answer. Uh, and the, the classic moment happened to me on Monday when I did this. I, I went to a guy and he says, can you, can you remember what the question was again? So it, uh, you, you've got to roll it out correctly. Um, and I said, OK, the question is this, but I'm going to ask somebody else. And then I, I went, went back to him. So it's uh, it all it all sounds good in, in theory. Uh, but I'm, I'm reiterating a point quite a lot there is that planning of the questions, uh, if you want to have really quality answers, makes make, makes a difference. And the, the danger is lots of coaches ask a question with the answer, they know what the answer is. And I can remember being on an RFU coaching day uh, about three or four years ago, really, really good day, lots of really interesting things. And one of the coach developers was running a game and uh, they spent all the time just asking questions. And in the end, I started to be a bit cheeky to sit, ask questions back. And they just asked a question. It just became a bit of a, a, a to and fro. And it, it just becomes like, just, just tell me the answer. I, I can remember coaching uh, when I was with uh, the Wales women back in 20, oh, 2009, 2010, and asking a question. And one of the girls, says, she said, and she used a few um, fruity words in there as well just tell me the answer that's all i want to know because i just want to get on with it and eventually i did and they said right thank you very much and they were they were fine they were happy and they just got on with it uh so it, it, it's one of those difficult things that only comes with the experience uh however of course we've got a, the dial has to sort of flip between one and the other and often coaches are 
the danger is they are too much tell, tell, tell. And that's where that's where the, uh, we've got to be careful. Well, that's, I think it also, can, it also boils down to um, your understanding of the players and, and them as individuals. Um, I know that I've got some players that I work with that... Um, like 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 that like that woman that you coached in, in with with Wales that just just tell me the answer and I'll and I'll, and I'll go and do it and that's that's great they love it whereas some of them like to you know like to be coerced into thinking that they've come up with the idea when actually <laughs> you know the powers all the the powers all up here <laughs> yeah so it's, it's like the Je- the Jedi coaching you will know the answer and uh, they <laughs> oh, oh yeah I know the answer yeah, yeah that's that, that's the one and it's and I think yeah. Well, with all coaches that we've had on um, across all the episodes we've had on the podcast, you know, understanding the the players and, and the people that you're working with is always is always is more than essential than than any other aspect of coaching because that's you know that impacts your behaviours, that impacts how you plan the session, and then ultimately their engagement within the session as well. So um, it's certainly interesting, and I think you know, and that's where it's important for us coaches to reflect on our own on our own sessions. And the way that and what, and what we say, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't think any of us can say that we're we're the perfect coach, um, but we're all. But that's why we, that's why Chris and I do this podcast. We like speaking to coaches because, you know, you opened my eyes to something there, and it's and it's powerful stuff. Yeah, I I, I think um, the danger often for coaches uh, is that they run a session and they have a very uh, clear idea of what they think the session is going to go like and they're looking for it all the time and if they see enough they think they've cracked it uh and um most sessions are imperfect and we, we still probably are thinking about how how do players really learn and there's a there's a very strong debate on uh the the, the way that we improve our decision making and the, i i don't think anyone necessarily can say they've, they've got the real answer However, if we if we're connecting with the players and giving them enough chances to play play rugby, then in, in the end, by osmosis, more than anything else, they may come out with uh, be better at rugby players. And sometimes I, I can reflect back on times when I don't think I've coached particularly well with a team, and they still improve uh, because they're they're a group of players who um, have um, just within themselves coached themselves, they've talked to themselves and they've found, they found solutions. And other times when I think I've done a, I've done a cracking job and they've, they, they don't, for some reason, they're, they're not progressing. And I, it's very hard to put your finger on it why. And uh, that's what makes the research, uh, academic research so hard because it's very hard to isolate the reasons why players have improved. Um, and uh, I mean, you, you, you will set up an exercise either in a lab or on the field, and you can't tell why that player's improved because they've, they've come to the session with all sorts of things in the back of their mind, and it might be something that someone said in the car on the way there. Uh, that's that's changed their mind, uh, and they've decided, oh, I'm going to try this, or they might have seen a clip on YouTube, uh, which has just made them... I mean, I... Not that... Uh, you, you look at yourself in your own ways that you've learnt and you try and maybe put that across. I mean, I, uh, I tried to learn sidestepping by watching the Phil Bennett sidestep in the, in the bar bars. And I spent hours and hours and hours watching that and then trying to replicate it to the extent that when I was walking down the corridors, when I was a teacher, I would picture kids coming towards me and I would just slightly move my shoulder one way and then the other way, just imagining that I was going to beat them. Now, whether that improved me as a sidestepper, I, I don't know, but that's that's how I was learning at the time. If only I'd had all that academic research, they might say that's absolute rubbish, Dan. You need to uh, you need to be doing it in a different way. Oh, by the by the way, don't don't go down corridors with kids trying to sidestep them. I think John John Kerwin uh, ran through forests at the top speed, avoiding trees. That was the way he did it, and. Uh, I mean, that would never be used now, but trying to beat static objects. He was quite good at wing, being a wing, wasn't he? I don't think I ever worried about sidestepping. I definitely just <laughs> took the, the, the path of least resistance. <laughs> That's why I did Or the path of most resistance, maybe. Oh, well, yeah, into bodies. Yeah, there we go. That's why you shouldn't be walking down a corridor with... with, 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 with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I'd probably end up getting hurt myself. <laughs> um, but we we talk within coaching and uh, around, you know, we coach through games and we we coach through 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 skill zones. How how important Dan would you say it is for for coaches to actually have a an understanding or existing knowledge of the game to shape the sessions that they put together in terms of being able to react to stuff that happens. So we're three here chatting about predominantly rugby, but uh, like we said, a lot of the stuff would be trans- transferable to other sports. But, you know, we know the game relatively well because it's been our jobs for a lot of for a lot of cases. So for the volunteer, the amateur coach that, that's sort of watching it, that's coaching within grassroots, that's maybe never played the game, but the kid's been doing it at school, they've been roped in as a volunteer at the club. How, what advice would you sort of maybe give them to help expand that understanding? Because we know rugby is complex. So what, what advice would you give them to maybe help expand their existing knowledge of sport and how they could then maybe apply that to, to their coaching um, sessions? Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's a great challenge for, um, for a coach is to understand why why they're coaching what they're coaching so if you're in uh soccer uh why do they why does the player need to control the ball and pass it or why won't they want to use a one touch why would they want to move into space um in in the way they they do now um I th- again this is uh, something which i've changed i've changed my mind or my focus in the last uh two or three years is to understand the game the players are actually playing not the game they're going to play in the future now, what I mean by that is that um, if you're working with an under eight or under nine, certainly in rugby, uh, but in, in soccer, it will be the same. They play on a different size pitch uh, with a different number of players, but also their opposition players will have a different skill level. So you have to have the right expectation of what the game looks like for the player that you're coaching now. Now, of course, it helps if you understand where they're going to go in the future. Um, but we, we all know uh, coaches who have been doing uh, a one three three one with their under 12s uh, as a structure, uh, which is totally inappropriate and under 12s in rugby, t- in rugby terms, or they might be running a, a certain structure in, in soccer, trying to play the ball out of the back. Well, you don't play the ball out of the back in under eights uh, in soccer. You, you, you just run, dribble, pass, shoot. Um, and uh, if you happen to pass to a teammate, that's a bonus. And uh, under nines or in tag rugby, if you string together two passes, that's fantastic. But if you're spending all your time trying to run three or four pass, passing chains, passes in a row, uh, under eights, under nines, then you're not, you're not understanding it. So how, how, does the, how does the grassroots coach do that? Well, part of it is watching as many games as they, they possibly can. Uh, YouTube is a good good place. Uh, uh, when I work with um, independent edu- coach education, um, and they say, right, we were doing a course with um, on under eights, under nines. Well, I haven't coached much under eights, under nines recently, so I go onto YouTube, look at under eights, under nines games, try and get a good understanding of what that game looks like, and then say, this is what the game looks like, guys, and this is what you've got to you've got to focus on, and that that really that really helps uh but also just look at what your players can do now and help them improve a little bit on what they can do already uh, it's not big steps um if they can pass the ball two meters can you help them pass the ball three meters uh if they can pass standing still can you make them pass when they're jogging uh, it's just just little little steps along that. So that's one thing. And the other thing is uh, to understand the principles of the game. And um, rugby is uh, the main principle of rugby is uh, in attack, score tries in in defence to get the ball back. And you can then layer on the principles of the game that uh, you might talk about go forward, support, continuity, and all those sorts of things. But if you said to uh, an under nine, how's your continuity? Uh, I mean, quite a lot of coaches, I mean, I struggle sometimes to think whether you and the I does go in continuity, let alone 
I know what it what it means. So you've got to just help them understand the little bits of the principles without going too much into go forward. If uh, for any coach who has coached tag rugby, uh, when you when they line up from the free pass, the first principle of play because you've got the boys don't have to gain possession is to run forward. Well, it makes no sense to run forward because you're just running into the defence. So if you're saying, I'm going to coach the principles of play, I'm going to run forward, what does that actually look like for a tag player and what is going to help, help them? So uh, I'm giving you a simple answer there at all, really. Uh, apart from, I suppose, uh, right, I'm going to try and simplify it very, very quickly. This is what I should have said right at the start, is know the game that your players are playing and the second thing is sort of understand the principles of why they are playing the game. So that's that. That's what I would would say. Uh, that, I think that's simplified well because it, it goes <laughs> down because it goes it goes down to the again we spoke about it a lot is the what is the wants and needs of the players of, of why they're there because I think sometimes if you go into too much technical or tactical and there's lots of standing around and that that that's clear that then your activity structure maybe isn't getting high learner engagement and if they've mm. not got high learner engagement then you're not going to really look at achieving your uh, objectives that you might have set for that session but then also the, the, that's then probably potentially going to get then you more stressed out because you're not getting towards mm. the goal that you want to do which is then going to impact on your behaviors and then that's probably going to cause learner engagement to take a little bit more of a <laughs> A train. that's when people are more likely to leave the sport I suppose. Mm. And that that's kind of the role that we as coaches especially in that lower level is it's grassroots kids rug, kids rugby kids, kids sport is you know it's it's keeping people active if they're there we want as many people to come to our sessions so therefore mm. we need to make it, the sessions as fun as and engaging as possible so you don't need to fill it with loads of technical tactical detail it's are they actually enjoying themselves for what they want to get out of it and then we can layer that on further the further up the chain we get yeah and getting that balance on that that fun uh, and energized emo um, engagement is that yeah you're going to do things which aren't going to look like the game of rugby which may not have an enormous amount to do with really improving a player as a, a totally efficient a top class uh, decision maker they're just they're enjoying themselves with their, their teammates and that's uh, that's the balance that's the uh, the, uh, the 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 sort of the light light in the shade in in the session. I think the other thing about engagement is that um, it's important the players come away they feel they've learned something because a lot of engagement comes from feeling that you're improving. Uh, yeah, you're going to go along to a session and uh, you're going to be with your mates, but you can sort of be with your mates in in any um, in lots of different places. So. Let's also give them something where they come away and say, oh, I've come a bit better at that. I mean, if you look at um, uh, video game design, uh, without going into the sort of uh, some of the other parts of it, one of the things that keeps players engaged in it is that they're always improving a little bit. They, they're picking up something where they've, they've beaten something in the game and then they've, they've, they've progressed to the to the next stage and that that's enjoyable and that what takes them back so we, we can do that in the sessions where yeah your, your passing is improved now it might be in the next session that their passing is improved but they they can't execute that pass but just like in your video game you think oh i know how to beat this guy but i can't quite do it i can't quite do it i've done it now but i didn't know how to do it and i couldn't quite press the the x and the o and the square in the right combination I mean, if you saw me play FIFA, I press them all the time anyway, so I've got no idea on the combinations at all. Uh, so I, th I think that's, that's, that's important. And we mustn't forget that, um, yeah, they're there for a rugby session or a football session or whatever, so they've got to do some of that. But we've also got to, as you said, they've got to come away thinking, I enjoyed that session, not just because um, Chris made me run a thousand laps to get me fitter, and I feel that's because uh, I feel that's the sort of thing you might do, Chris. Oh, you see uh, me. You see me. Coming. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. this is coming across more and more as you say. You don't <laughs> sidestep. Uh, but also, yeah. they've uh, they they've enjoyed it because of the banter or the little game at the start, or that they've just said, right, I've, I I know when I go into contact that I've just got to get a bit squarer, and we did that a bit more today, and I just feel I know if I can't perform it 
and that that's that's what's going to make the difference. I was um I was <laughs> last year I was doing some um, I was teaching on one of the modules, and uh, so the, one of the students came with it for an under eight football session, under nine football session, um, and he'd planned and he delivered a, a rondo. Now my football knowledge isn't particularly great, but I've watched um I've I've watched some all or nothing and seen that Pep Guardiola's done it, so therefore it must it must be must be good. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> you could see that even with the group that he he had in that session, that they weren't interested. They didn't really know what they were doing. And I was like, that's him afterwards. Like, do, do you think that activity is probably appropriate for for under nines? And he just looked at me straight blank in the face. Man, yeah. And I was like, well, I mean, I've watched a lot of through my previous job with RFU, I've watched a lot of under nines and rugby. And one of the key problems they have is finding space because it's very much like bees around a honeypot. It's mm. where the, wherever the ball is, everyone seems to be there. And there just seems to be this crowd of people that seem to go over. So if they're struggling with that, is how are you going to, how are we going to then apply a rondo to what they want to do in a game? So I guarantee if you go into a game, it's just going to have the same outcome of they'll all just crowd around the ball again. Mm. It took him a while to sort of process sort of what I was talking about. Actually, how, how could we have done a small sided game that could have encouraged maybe some of the similar objectives that you wanted, but getting them to really recognize where space is and move around in something that's going to keep them all active and stood on a corn waiting around. Mm. Well, I, I, one of the things, uh, more recently that I've understood is that uh, if you if you go to an under nine session and you 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 say right it's up to you what you want to do they probably won't play rugby they'll probably they might play something else but they'll play the game that they know so they they might play British Bulldogs or uh, I'm not it's not allowed to call British Bulldogs but I think for older uh, less PC people will know that uh, I think it's the chicken and the fox or something it's called anyway it, they will play that uh but i remember uh some of the um kids once in a small space um they were playing knees rugby and i thought that that was great because they wanted to play some contact they recognized that they didn't have much space so they but they like to go back to games which are very very simple that they will enjoy and that's um and as you said if you if you look at what they enjoy and say right we're going to play this game that's we love that game they like to go back to games and then you just add in one change one small change to to help maybe reveal something then that that's been a big learning for me because i think i've sometimes come in uh, in previous times with complicated uh games which take them ages to learn and aren't tried and tested and therefore they just they get frustrated i get frustrated and we're not we're no better off. Yeah, I, well, I, I do think, well, I know I, I'm very, very guilty of uh, making things more complicated sometimes than, than they need to be. We want to try and simplify that complexity as best we can to digest the information that the players want. But you, you write from sort of kids play games at school all the time at break dinner and they generally come up with them off the cuff with their own rules and the run around like lunatics doing it with with the friends anyway mm. and i don't think uh, but i think sometimes in coaching we feel as though we need to control that when actually giving some ownership to the players on if you maybe can give them a theme and ask them to then maybe come up with the type of game that they want they're actually quite um they can be quite creative with the types of activities that they come up mm. to based on the knowledge that they want. And you can convert some of it to some of the key principles that you still want to learn and get out of it anyway, sometimes. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so uh, I also, um, I will do that a little bit, but I've also seen plenty of the, the playground games that are actually dreadful. Uh, I mean, I've watched them play these uh, rugby games uh, at school and uh, the rules just uh, favour the big, the big fast kid. And everyone else is not not really involved, and uh, it would just take a simple change to the to the ruling, not that they would want to listen to it, which would change change the game and make it make it more uh, more chances for the players to touch the ball. And the playground games are um, there is a section of it which is ideal, and there's a section of it which we've got to be very careful because because some playground games really suit. The bigger kid or the bully kid because they have they have the most say in the game it's their ball and they get the most benefit and the others are just happy to be 
involved in the game, but they're not actually benefiting if we're looking from a, a skills point of view. So it's it's that balance of trying to give the kids ownership, which is makes a massive difference if you can, and then coming up with some terrible ideas on how to play the game. I mean, just uh, just ridiculous. Like, yeah, or, well, I won't I won't say some of the stupid ones I've I've heard to do with ice cream or punching each other. Not together. I don't know. If someone's got my ice cream, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> what punching them? There we are. So we've created a game already. Punch for ice cream. I know how to win that one. Dan, it's been uh, it's been absolute. Uh, pleasure talking to you. Um, you've really, um, you've really got me thinking about stuff and um, assessing how I might go about doing some of the ways that I plan some of the activities that that that, that I go about. Um, just, um, but before before you sort of depart with the one one question that I get asked a lot from. Um, from, from coaches just when I'm, I'm out and about in rugby is is I'm quite blessed in the environment that I work with that I've always got a good group of in terms of numbers of players to work with um, and they always ask me questions around how do we how would you best create games with low numbers so if you've only got 11 or 14 players how can you try and create games that will still engage them but still relevant to what you want to be trying to do around Rugby, basically. Have you have you come across sort of in the different environments that you've worked with or some advice for coaches that, that have got them low numbers and how they can enhance their um, activity structures to, to still meet the wants and needs of the players and keeping them active, engaged and learning, but also how that might fit within your plan of whatever level you're at? Well, I think it is, uh, it is a challenge. And... Um... So what I've done uh, is I've often done a very heavily overloaded game. Uh, so let's say you've got um, 11, 12 players, so split them into three teams, um, give them a letter A, B and C. So A and B attack and C defends. And um, you might say, well, that's obvious. They get the, the, the team with more numbers are going to win every single time. Well, let's, uh, let's make it that the defending team um, get, can easily win the ball back so that makes it really hard for the attacking team so they've got to work harder to retain possession so for instance um if it's uh, if it's just a one-handed touch that's a tackle um and then the, the ball carrier's got to go to ground to present the ball and one player's got to go over now for me uh because there's no contest i would say the ball carrier's got to do a perfect ball presentation whichever one you should choose. I mean, um, it seems, I mean, I know we don't want to go too rugby specific, but a lot of coaches coach uh, long and strong. And um, it, in my mind, and I think in most people's mind, just don't see that that often in the game. So I uh, probably want to do a different version of that. Uh, but you choose the, you want them to be totally accurate with that. And you want the next player to be totally accurate with the way that they go over and protect the ball. And if they don't do that, then the player who's made the mistake, their team then become the defenders. And therefore the attacking team um, has to work very hard on their skills, but then they've still got the problems of having to beat, beat the defense. And uh, you give maybe give the defense some extra ways to turn over the ball, like, if you can get two players to touch, touch the ball carrier at the same time, that also creates a mistake. Now, that, that's just one way of doing it. But what it does do is means that eight players are playing together, which is more like a, a more more game like than six v six. Um, and that's and that's that's the challenge, I think, because I think a six v six game, certainly under twelves, under thirteens, it. it the players aren't quite skillful enough to make make that make that realistic. So that's that's one way. I think also, um, Harrison, you were talking about um, creating scenarios on the pitch. Or I, I wanted you to say, and this is 
So we're going to put ourselves here, here and here on the pitch. What are you going to do from here? And maybe just have a couple of defenders in the key positions. Um, and then they've got to work out what they're going to do, do from there. So uh, that would make it a bit more game realistic. Uh, but other than that, uh, I think that I would take game slices. Um, and right, we're in this part of the pitch. Uh, we would normally have this number of players in this area of the pitch. So, uh, for instance, uh, we're defending our line uh, by the touch line. Uh, one side's got eight defenders. The other side's got five attackers. Go. And um, that, that, I know there's an overload there and the attackers have got work to work really hard to, to retain possession and get over, get over the game line or... Um, we, you talked a, bit, a little bit earlier about exits, right? I'm going to put you um, in the 15 meter area on the left hand side of the pitch. Uh, you're in your own 22. Uh, the ruck is here, so you just put some cones out for the ruck. Um, and how you're going to exit from there. So, from a soccer situation, uh, you might say we're in uh, the left hand side of the field. Um, just outside the penalty area. Um, how are we going to create um, a situation where this player is in a position to shoot? And you've got three defenders here, one midfielder here on one side. You've got, and, and then suddenly the, the, you, you've sliced up the game into its component parts. Now, of course, not apart from when you're with under nines, not all of the players are in that little narrow area, tiny area. <laughs> like uh, bees around the honey pot so that's maybe a way of maybe a way of doing it no, I think that's, uh, that's some, some some good advice there. it's definitely because that, that's the, because I've always got good numbers it's actually something that I find difficult to answer sometimes because mm. I'm just like oh like I've been a long time since I've gone into uh, schools and coach with, with low numbers at an after school club when it's raining sideways and getting dark in 20 minutes and you've got to, it's, been, it's been a long time since I've done it but I think because that's where I'm always sort of coming from now is how trying to align the views of the game is how to create that but actually that's quite a simple it's not it's not simple but it's a way that you can still actually create that situation even with the numbers that you've got and getting them to work in I said combinations of how it might work with within a game so I think that, that that's that's quite useful to sort of get an idea of well, something I've seen, uh, I, and I, I could be making this off to my head, but I've got a feeling that someone's done this before, is that uh, you have that almost like uh, three stations, which are three different scenarios, and you, you go from scenario A to B to C. So the players, uh, it's interleaved. So they are solving a problem uh, in one area, and then they've almost got to forget that so solution and move to another area, because that's what happens in the game. You're not... You're not on solving the problem on their five meter line eight times in the game. You might do it twice, but 30 minutes apart, unless you're Exeter and then you're there pretty much all the time and uh, solving the problem by scoring a try every time. That's not a dig at Exeter. They, uh, they're, uh, they're obviously extremely effective in that five meter area. They certainly are. <laughs> so Dan, thank, thanks very much for coming on. Um, it's been uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, I think there's lots of information there that that coach will be able to take and use. And um, thought provoking, I think, is is probably the the word to use. So thank you for uh, for coming on this afternoon and, and having a chat with us. Well, no, thank you. It's been great for me because uh, first of all, you've you've provoked some thoughts in me. You've made me think about things. Uh, a couple of things you've said as well, which have made me uh, think about what I've got to do to tighten up on certain things and also think think more around uh what I, i've got to do so these i mean this is this is great for me because it's it's reflective and just to talk it out sometimes is is as good as thinking about it so thank you very much for the opportunity anytime all right thank you thank you harrison a great uh interview there with with dan um i, I know i uh, took a lot away from it uh, how about you 
Yeah, I did as well. Um, it very much, I think, in parts there, he went full edu- uh, coach educator role there with the amount of questions he posed towards us. But they're the kind of episodes that I love. I love because you, you, we get involved, we get engaged, and actually, we're getting a um, we're getting a free coach ed session out of that, aren't we? Yeah, and, and that's been quite. That's what we've noticed all the way through this, especially with some of the people we've been in season two. You know, that's why we wanted to get going, wasn't it? So that we learn at the same time. But one thing I really got or took away from sort of chatting to Dan is it, it kind of um, a lot of it reinforced what we spoke about in season one, um, specifically around sort of understanding the who and understanding what. So we touched on bits about similar again that like we did with Richard. This theme of people comes up quite a lot, and he sort of goes about whenever you're coaching, whatever environment you're in. You've got to know your players and you've got <clears throat> the importance of understanding their wants and needs because the players want to know that when they're going into that session, that they're going into that game or that skill zone, that they're, they're going to come away learning something, but also that it's rectifying the stuff that, that they feel they need to be working on. Yeah, and that's, you know, uh, and that's always the, you know, the, the, the toughest thing about coaching. Um, you know, it's... You know, creating these you know, these environments in which you know, it's a balance between the well, we want it to be a balance between the enjoyment and, and learning, and which sure they're getting away, uh, taking away the key technical and technical elements of of whatever sport whatever sport they're in. Um, and, you know, and like like you know, like we've discussed, this games based approach is is the one that's you know that has gained a lot of traction recently, and is is the one where we're encouraged to do uh, probably a lot more as coaches. You know, and actually having an understanding of your your participants and and what their wants and needs are, very much shapes the kind of games that you should be looking at. Yeah, and one of the one of the key things I've I've brought down here from from there was <clears throat> when we coined the game, we took on it before that you end up getting distracted with the the noise of everything else that's going on, and and I brought it down here that he said you know you can end up chasing rabbits and never catch one, which I really like because it's true you end up getting distracted by everything else. And I mean, one thing that he Dan started to use without being prepped either was some of the terminology that we use internal in in season one was around when he's coaching. Now he's starting to to really focus his sessions on the internal logic of rugby. So is he actually coaching the game? Is it relating back to the um, the relevance of the laws? Are they being applied? And you know, he talks about how you know three sixty degree games are really good as a sort of energizers but the build up towards that if you really want to look at the learning of rugby should the game should be at the heart of it yeah well it's yeah rugby rugby can be complex enough let alone when you start playing 360 and you know you know and there are there are times and places for it but you know like you know like they like said it's you know we can very much get lost within within sessions and and the, and the crazy stuff that goes on in our minds to create sessions that aren't necessarily what we might deem as more enjoyable, but actually, are they still get, are the key learning messages get, getting across? And I think you no, know, and, and even just in terms of the behaviours and how he and how he plans. So he even has talked around, you know, he's beginning to write down the questions he knows he's going to ask in the session before before it's even happened. So like he's got the game in mind, he's got you know that internal logic there. He knows what rugby needs to look like and what it looks like within these maybe a constraints based game. But right, what am I? What what questions am I going to ask to make sure that I'm checking for understanding and engagement? Exactly, and and, and I suppose that's for, for us. I mean, it's day to day for us, so that that's sort of how we we kind of operate. But I think that really comes down if you link it back to what we spoke about with Tony around the importance of your planning and getting an idea of, you know, the objectives that you want to get at them certain points for you, as you approach your key performance indicators, whether that's mid, halfway, or quarter later during the season. So stuff like that, if you're well-prepped, well-planned from the very beginning of your, I'm going to say program, because even if you're coaching under sixes, it's still a program. You've still got a season that you can plan around that's still a program. Your objectives are different, but it's still, it's still a program. If you've got the, the, a level that you need to get to, that allows you to pre-plan the types of questions that you're going to use, the, the, the overall objectives that you want to get. And, and actually, the reality is, it makes your life a hell of a lot easier. Oh yeah, well, it goes back to it goes almost back to what um what we touched on with, with Tony in, in the previous episode. You know, if we can we we can do a large amount of the work before we even go into 
into a block, in this example, into a session, then when it comes to the session, we know what we're doing. We can fire it off. The energy, the energy and the buzz is, is still there. You know, it's oh, it's such a buzzkill when you've got when you've got a good session planned and you've got good gains, but then the coach stops the session and he's asking 101 questions because he's looking for that answer that he's got in his head. That's that's that, that's it. Just it's just a bus kiss. So like that, that's a, I think it's a great example. Of what I'm going to plan, what I'm going to ask, and so I know for when at the end of this one, this is what I'm going to this is what I'm going to check for, and we're ready to go. But then what surprised me, and well, he says he didn't deliberately mean to catch me out. You know, well, I'm not I'm not holding any grudges, but you know, his it, just around the tell, just like sometimes it's important that us as coaches, what well, we've got, a, we've got the information in here. You know, sometimes we don't, but when we do, we, we it, it, it's up here. So, you know, sometimes we need to just tell, and we need to, you know, it, it, like I say, nothing can frustrate a player more than having to stop halfway through a, a game-based session to sit around and, and talk for a bit. And I love this example of when he was coaching Wales women that they, just, that one of them just wanted to just just tell me the answer. He said the more fruity language was used, and. I, I can imagine it was, but you know, sometimes the players just need to be told what they need to be doing. I know, but I think that whole that whole piece is quite common. I think in terms of the activity time to talk time, when you know we can be able to do stuff on the go when needed, but it's having the confidence to be able to do that. And I'll never forget, I did a, I've done, I've done a fair few coaching awards as an educator for the RFU. When you be, you know, you get ten minutes to deliver. And one of them, I, I actually time that a coach used three minutes of that 10 minutes sort of just talking. And then if you break that down as a percentage for the whole session, that's, if you did that over an hour, that's quite a lot. And But it wasn't until you mentioned it. And, and it's like a, a, a glass shattering moment, I suppose, of the go, Jesus, do I really talk for that long? Because yeah, you're not clear about what you want to get out of it. And it does, it just comes back to, do you know what you want to get out of it? Are you confident enough to shape your questioning and other areas to get to that point? So, so we, we touched on a little bit around the, if we ever needed like a, a breakaway zone, you know, to go away and do stuff. And a lot of them tend to be pre-planned, but actually just because it's pre-planned doesn't necessarily mean it's going to meet the issues that you're finding within the game. And the players, if you're doing a game and you're taking them out to go and do something else, it kind of needs to be correcting what's going wrong within the game for them to connect to it for them to connect to it gets engagement high and that engagement is then going to again dictate the overall success of your session yeah but then well, like I said like, like I said it within the episode there's nothing wrong with you know almost preempting where you think players are going to struggle within the game and having like a bank of interventions or that comes back to knowing your players doesn't it oh yeah all the stuff that we spoke about in season one of you really need to be able to do that. That goes back down to your planning, but you'll be able to preempt where they're going to struggle. Support. Yeah, I was trying to think of a polite word to do it. We're getting too many explicit episodes going out, so this kind of just tries to clean <laughs> up a little bit. <laughs> but no, I think that was a really good chat with Dan. Um, I know I, I've took a lot away from it, and even, like I say, the fact that he, he was challenging us and asking us questions on stuff just really makes you think. Um, and I'm enjoying that already as part of this season. Yes, yeah. Well, we've um, that's two episodes in, and we've already recorded a couple more, which have also have also thrown some questions back at us. And you know, and, and that's that's what that's why we these 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 episodes are meant to be a casual conversation between coaches, in which you know a wider audience can can listen to and, and hopefully engage in. So, you know. If, if we, if you think that anything's been missed, or you want to hear any other conversations that Chris and I can have with 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 guests, please feel free to 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 get in contact and and let us know because you know we we always we're always here to listen and take on board take on board feedback and and when where we where to go next, aren't we, Chris? Yeah, yeah, another good one, another good one. Uh, guys, like I said, reach out. Charlie's got all of our social media details at the end. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with episode three. We will see you next time. Cheers for listening. Don't forget to join in the discussion at Big Breakdown HQ on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram.